Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're going to be doing another episode of Airsoft Tech Talk Q&A. For those who aren't familiar with this uh, type of video, what we basically do is I post a community update picture on my YouTube channel asking for some questions for the next episode of Airsoft Tech Talk Q&A. And those that are the most popular, i.e. upvoted the most, or the most interesting to me, are the ones I answer. And I try to answer about four to five per video. So without wasting any more time, let's start jumping into those questions. Zilliman asks, I've been looking for a dual sector gear for my Crytac Vector. Are these gears universal or do I need a specific model to fit my gun? So a standard version 2, version 3 dual sector gear from Siege Tech or SHS will fit into a Crytac Vector. Now, to kind of talk about this a little more, a version 2 and version 3 DSG gear will fit into any version 2 or version 3 gearbox shell. Now, how well will they work is a different story, you know, in regards to other things about the gearbox shell. So, for example, the, ver the Siege Tech dual sector gear was pretty much designed for an M4 style platform, for the most part. Um, and this is because the air nozzle length is just about right, and the barrel length can be however long you want. All these other features are there that kind of enable the Siege Tech dual sector gear to work really well with the M4 platform. Now, if you take that same DSG gear, gear and you put it into a G36 with the appropriate length barrel, you still might have some volume, voluming problems and air loss because of how long the G36 air nozzle is. And so you can run into some problems here and there, but for the most part, a DSG uh, version two, version three DSG gear set will fit into, you know, your standard version two, version three uh, gearbox shell. It'll fit into your standard uh, Crytac uh, Chris Vector here. A Siege Tech version two, version three DSG gear will fit into a P90. Um, they pretty much fit into most guns out there. Now, always read the item description before buying the product and do, do your own research and make sure it does fit in your gun. But as a general rule, the version two, version three Siege Tech dual, dual sector gear fits in almost every version two, version three gearbox shell I can think of. Kieran Walsh asks, how to limit the ding noise on certain guns after every shot commonly seen on G&Gs? So I know exactly the sound you're talking about. It's really annoying. It happens this, you know, basically as soon as the gun is finished cycling, you hear this ringing, reverberating sound almost, and it's very annoying. And essentially it's caused by too short of a mainspring. So a lot of stock guns, G&Gs included, um, come with very short AEG springs. And I don't really know why they do this. They probably have a reason. It probably helps save them some money uh, in the long run. But basically what this does is when your gear set pulls back your piston and compresses that spring and then gets the last tooth, lets that piston go, and that spring shoves that piston forward, the spring kind of shoves forward. And then when it hits the front of the gearbox shell, it kind of bounces back and forth in there and causes that reverberating sound. And that's that ding or ring after every single shot. And it sounds really, really annoying. Uh, basically, how you fix this is you get a, an appropriate length spring. Uh, so what I do is I use Garter SP100s, SP110s, SP120s, and uh, install that into my airsoft gun. And almost nine times out of 10, uh, 10 times out of 10, I would say in my experience, it gets rid of that annoying ringing and dinging sound. So more than likely, that is the problem and that is the fix. Joey Dies asks, I've built guns for myself as well as guns that I've sold or traded to other people, but I'm wondering how to get started teching as a side hustle. I love the hands-on problem-solving nature that comes with teching, so I would love it if I could make a little bit of money rather than spend it. A couple of things you need to understand before starting doing airsoft tech work as any sort of side hustle. You need to understand how large your customer base is. A lot of places don't, you know, do much, you know, airsofting. So like where I live in Kentucky, there's a couple places that are, you know, that do airsoft, but and it's popular in those areas, but that's about it. And so unless you have people ship you guns like they do for me and they're willing to do that for me, then it's going to be kind of hard to get that consistent flow of work to do. Another thing too is you need to seriously evaluate how good you are at problem solving and working on these airsoft guns in general. And I mean, you need to honestly assess how good you are at that. So when I first started doing tech work for people, I did not seriously and truly assess my ability to 
do this work adequately? And so I wasn't very good at it. I genuinely just wasn't uh, compared to what I am now where I'm confident I have no problem working on 99% of airsoft guns out there. Not a problem at all. And if it's something I've never worked on before, I can figure it out. That's not necessarily the hard part anymore. Um, so you need to seriously evaluate how good you are at this. Number three, you seriously need to evaluate how good you are at managing your own time and working on something while you're at home like I am. Um, now, some people work from home and they have that really good ability to understand that there's a time for work and there's a time for play and there's a time for leisure and all this stuff. Um, but people like me, I physically go to work. I cannot work from home. I'm a nurse. I work in an ICU. I have to go to work. Um, and that's really good for my mind. Work is here, play is here. Okay, so now I have work there, leisure, play, and additional work here. Um, sometimes I get a little distracted and I have difficulty uh, you know, doing these projects, which leads to kind of cramming in the end. Um, I've gotten a lot better at it over the course of a year, but it's still a problem that I personally have. So unless you are very, very good at managing your time, you might run into that as a stumbling, blo stumbling block and then rush to meet project uh, dates. So those are some things you seriously need to consider um, in terms of how much to charge, how much you want to do here and there. Um, you need to seriously, again, evaluate those three things. And then from there, you can figure out, OK, what's my time worth on the hour? What's my time worth here? Um, do I need to buy tools here and there? Stuff like that. Um, Another thing too is I don't charge by the hour, I charge by the project. I don't think it's fair to charge the customer an hourly rate for something that might take me a little longer because I'm a little slower um, at one thing than I am at another thing. So one gun I can finish in an hour, another gun I can finish in four hours. Both of them get the same amount of work done to it and the same amount of detail done to it, but they both uh, take a little bit more time. And I never saw that as fair to charge the customer more for that. So those are some things you need to consider, whether you, don't, you want to charge an hourly rate or just a flat rate, um, how, much, how much gun work you can take on at once. I do five guns a month, and that's some pretty easy deadlines for me to meet, and it's pretty enjoyable. Also, don't make this thing you know, a hobby. Don't make this just your full-fledged career if you're not really ready for that, or even a side hustle if you're not really ready for that. Um, I know for me, I took on a lot of guns at one point in my life, and it was like, okay, I enjoy playing airsoft, but I also enjoy doing the teching thing. And then I started to resent the teching thing because I did so much of it and I was so bogged down by it. Um, so those are some, some things you need to consider. If all those things you've considered and you understand, um, then go to your local field, kind of have a power gun that you kind of ex that show off at a local field that kind of gets you some customers or advertise online, stuff like that. Um, the advertising online thing can be a little bit harder because not everybody has the platform that some airsofters do that they can easily advertise with. But uh, traditionally, uh, getting tech work has been done by showing off your guns at your local field. So I have several guns that are kind of my show off guns that perform really well, they're really fancy and they sound really cool. And uh, that kind of gets me some customers here and there. So that's kind of a roundabout way of answering your question. There's a lot of things to consider. I don't think it's something for every tech. I think it's something that people should consider if they really enjoy this job and they also find leisure in doing this work. And so evaluate those things, figure out what your time is worth and figure out what you're capable of and go from there. Jan Zugik asks, what do you think about brushless motors? I think brushless motors are super duper cool. Um, pretty much bringing airsoft stuff closer to the modern day age as DC motors, uh, DC brushed motors have been around forever. Um, and they do have their limitations and their drawbacks and their voltage, you know, peaks and whatnot and all this stuff. So I like the idea of brush, uh, brushless motors. I have uh, gotten my hands on a couple and I've used a couple. Um, but the problem with them right now is that they're so dang expensive. Uh, a brushless motor can cost you $180, $250. That's a lot of money. And I'm really not interested in dropping that kind of money on a just a single motor when I can buy a brush motor for $30, you know, a nice MOSFET for a hundred bucks. And then all that combined, I have less, I've put less money into than just a brushless motor. So do I think they're really cool? Yes. Do I think that they're necessary for every airsoft gun? No. Do I think they're way too expensive? Yes. Now that's probably because of a lot of material shortages in our country right now. And I guess globally as well. Um, I think they're cool. Um, I think they're definitely something we should be looking into more, but I don't think that uh, every airsoft gun needs one. I don't think every airsoft gun is gonna have one. Um, and that being said, I don't think I'm gonna really pay for one that's that expensive. So, eh, 
kind of meh right now. Um, I will make a video on brushless motors coming up. I do have a couple, like I said, that I've been playing with. They're cool, like I said, but again, way too expensive right now. When the cost comes down and they get more cost effective, and then I can look into incorporating them into regular builds. OP Airsoft asks, what's the most cursed gun you have worked on? The most cursed gun of mine I've ever owned and worked on is probably my Echo 1 P90. The thing is very difficult to get to feed right, it's very difficult to upgrade tap of plates, it's very difficult to uh, do anything with the electrical system, it's just an all around difficult gun. It's really cool when you get it working right, but it takes a lot of time and a lot of patience. Um, the most difficult customer gun I've ever worked on was probably this really old GMP M4 that I worked on a long time ago that no matter what I did, I couldn't, I kept running into problems. Couldn't get the motor height, you know, and bevel to pinion shimming right. It was always being weird. Finally got that right. And then the uh, uh, GMP gearbox screw, like the little threads on them, stripped. So I couldn't attach the motor grip to, or the, the pistol grip to the gearbox shell anymore. And so I was having trouble with that, obviously. So I did helicoils, that worked great. Um, but then I ran into some problems later on with like feeding and AOE correction stuff. It was just, it was a nightmare. I uh, finally got it working right, but it definitely was not worth my time. Um, a general rule of thumb, uh, version three guns that have medium type motors, huge pain in the butt. Um, just stay away from them at all costs if you can. All right guys, that's gonna have to do it for this episode of Airsoft Tech Talk Q&A. Thank you very much for watching. I greatly appreciate it. If you wouldn't mind, please like, comment, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. It goes a long way in helping this channel grow. In addition, uh, comment down below and tell me if you disagree with any of my answers. If you do, please give me your reasoning. I like to hear the opposite opinion. But like I said, it's going to have to do it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next video of whatever the heck I'm doing. But until then, stay tuned, Tex.